Thanks everyone uh, for being with us uh, as we begin this morning, especially to those of you who are here as attendees. Uh, we're grateful for you to you for joining us so early in the morning. I um, hope that uh, this will be a, a meaningful and enjoyable session for you. Uh, unlike the uh, traditional Zoom calls that many of you have undoubtedly been uh, engaged in over recent weeks, uh, you as attendees uh, can't really see one another and uh, can really only, only the panelists are able to uh, communicate, but uh, we do want to make sure that everyone knows that you do have a variety of ways of, of communicating. Uh, so there are, there is the chat box uh, that has been opened and want to encourage everyone to, to be active, contribute comments, uh, and questions there that are, especially if the comment or the question is, is meant for everyone, uh, if you'd like to do that. Uh, one of the things that we observed last night is that it gets relatively lonely sitting in your office and, and having all this pass by. So activity on the chat box helps remind us uh, that there are in fact at least 16 of you out there listening in this morning. Um, if you have a, a personal question or, or something that you're intending for just sort of one of the panelists, uh, then you might also wish uh, to use the Q&A box. Uh, so if you look on your toolbar, you should see a button that says Q&A. Uh, and there you can direct a question to a particular panelist. And especially if it's something that maybe you think they might want to answer just in writing, in, in responding a, in a quick note. Uh, then that might be an appropriate way to reach out to them rather than using the chat. And depending on how things are going and how, how we do for time, uh, we will uh, also uh, open up some space uh, for you to be able to raise your hand uh, and actually uh, speak questions and, and interact uh, with members of, uh, of the panel. Uh, so just want to make sure that everyone is aware of those various options that exist in terms of your communication. Uh, and uh, having said all that, uh, without any further ado, uh, let me turn things over uh, to Dr. John Nielsen, who's going to start us off this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be together today. And I'd like for us to begin with a word of prayer uh, for this whole day as we gather uh, together and then reflect a little bit upon a topic uh, that's uh, been important for me over these last almost 10 years now. And uh, I was originally intending to present uh, uh, some uh, research I've been doing on the area of lament and atonement in preparation for a contribution to a chapter in an upcoming uh, book that's being published. Uh, but in light of all the circumstances that we find ourselves in, uh, I just felt like maybe we just needed to, to live a little bit in the space of lament. And uh, so uh, following prayer, I'd like for us to spend a little bit of time in sort of a half devotional, half uh, presentation on this topic of lament and how it might be a helpful biblical resource for us in days such as we find ourselves in. So I'd like for us to begin with a word of prayer, not only for this session, but for our whole day together in the academic symposium, asking God's blessing upon all of us in these days. Let's pray together. Father God, we're grateful for your presence with us here this morning. And we are separated physically, but we are together in your spirit and by your grace. We pray your blessing upon each one who will present today over the course of these hours. We pray that you would give us clarity of heart and mind, help us to hear, help us to process, to understand, to reflect, and to apply truth to our lives in various ways. And so we thank you for your presence, for your grace and goodness, for, and for all of your good gifts. And for all that you have done, we give you thanks and praise. For we ask these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so as we, uh, as we focus this morning, I'd like for us to think a little bit about uh, the topic of, of lament as a faithful practice for such a time as this. And as we think about what we're going through, even the fact that we are participating in this academic symposium virtually and we're not uh, together in the Ruth Cameron Auditorium, uh, is a reminder that we are in different days. And it's been, uh, I think, significant that across these last weeks, uh, over a month in this period of time, uh, that the topic of lament has been named more than once in a variety of, of, uh, of places. And I think in an in appropriate way for us to reflect on that. And so as we, uh, as we share together, I want to also call you attention, your attention to a few other resources as we go along. Uh, and, and one in particular that I came across recently was an article uh, back on March 23rd. 
uh, by Scott uh, Barento. And uh, the article's title grabbed me, and it simply said that that discomfort you're feeling is grief. And one of the things that we want to reflect on as we go through a time like this is the, the loss that we experience. And when we experience loss, uh, what we're really experiencing is a, is a form of grief. And to be able to name that as grief is a helpful step in our process and in our mental and spiritual and emotional health together. And when we are naming grief and sorrow and loss, the Bible gives us a pattern and a permission and a language to express to God what we're feeling. And that language is the language of lament. I'm very grateful to, uh, to think about the ways that the art speaks to us, the arts speak to us in these kinds of times. If we were gathered together in Ruth Cameron Auditorium right now out in the foyer, there's a series of paintings by our own sort of artist in residence, Sarah Kirksey. And uh, there's a series of paintings there uh, that express a variety of emotions. And one of those paintings is called Sad and Broken. And with her permission, uh, I share that image with us today and, and use it as the backdrop uh, for, uh, for the uh, PowerPoint presentation that's available as well in, in the Canvas page. But, but her painting uh, sort of encapsulates for me this, this spirit and feeling and emotion of, of loss, of grief, of sorrow. And so for a few moments this morning in half devotion and half sort of academic presentation, I'd like for us to reflect on an overview of lament. Another resource that I just want to mention before I go on is another article that is a great summary of some of the basics of lament. And I post that in Canvas as well. And in this article, uh, Dr. Glenn Packerman uh, talks about lament as a form of praise, as proof of our relationship with God, as a pathway to intimacy with God and as a way to participate in the pain of others, as well as uh, a prayer for God to act. And, and that's a wonderful summary of what lament is all about. It is both passion and prayer, awareness of God's presence, uh, to continue to celebrate all the ways uh, that God is faithfully working among us. And I'm not sure why my uh, screen has gone away there. Let me come back here. I'd like for us to... Uh, uh, to share together and just a couple of components of what lament is. Michael Card, the author and musician, talks about lament as a sacred sorrow. It really is a combination of the sorrow that we feel, the grief that we feel, and adding to that our, our complaint, our request, our questioning. How long, O oh Lord? What's going on here? Why do I not sense your presence in various ways? And then to respond out of relationship with God, and ultimately in almost every psalm of lament, uh, we come to a place of, of trust. And so it could be said that this sacred sorrow of lament takes sorrow and complaint, adds relationship and trust, and is the cry of the heart in times of loss, of grief, of confusion, of anger, of fear, of uncertainty, this sacred sorrow that we offer to God as a form of praise. One of the classic psalms of lament, and lament are uh, psalms of lament are the, the dominant form. There are more psalms of lament in, in scripture than any other form. And one of the classic psalms of lament is Psalm 13, and I'd like to share it uh, with us this morning. The psalmist writes, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider me and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 13 gives us a pattern, a model, a sample, a, a way to reflect on the topic of lament, uh, a way to express uh, that cry, that sacred sorrow uh, to the Lord in ways that are, are helpful and faithful to us. Uh, lament is a common language of the Bible. It is central to the book of Psalms. At least 57 or 38% of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. And depending on you, how you sort of categorize them, maybe even a greater percentage, perhaps, uh, if you broaden the definition of lament or have a Psalm that has elements of lament, uh, that, that number can increase as high as 118 or 80% of the Psalms. Lament is present in the rest of the wisdom literature, including books like uh, the Book of Job and Lamentations. It's central to the prophets. Uh, 
and it is the faithful language of Jesus, who uh, is the man of sorrows acquainted with our grief. You see uh, Jesus weeping at the tomb of Lazarus, weeping over the city of Jerusalem, and crying the great cry of lament on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so lament that is present throughout scripture is still so many times a virtually foreign language in the story and the narrative of the lives of most Christians. Biblical lament is a form of worship and prayer. It is a faithful act because we take even this cry, even this confusion, even this sorrow, even this anger and fear, because we take that to God, it is a form of worship, acknowledging that God is the only person to whom we can turn with the feelings and emotions that we feel. It's a form of prayer. It is both sorrow and complaint. It, but it requires a relationship. The very question, God, where are you, assumes that there is a God present to hear my questioning his absence. Lament involves in every psalm except one, maybe two, uh, the psalms of lament uh, involve a turn. This moment in the psalm where after crying out that complaint and asking for God's presence and help, the psalmist uses a little word. It's just the conjunction, but in Hebrew, va. It's simply this moment where the psalmist turns and says, in spite of everything I'm feeling, I am going to trust in you and even praise you, if not now, at a future time. In fact, the only psalm of lament that fully laments and doesn't ever get any hopeful at all is Psalm 88. And perhaps there's one so that we know that when we feel that way, it's okay, but only one so that we don't make it our norm, that we take our lament and turn it to trust and praise. Lament is to be expressed both individually and corporately. But the challenge is that we, so much of the time, haven't given space for this faithful practice of lament. And we need to restore a place for lament in our lives, in our, in our relationships, in our churches, in our experience of what faithfulness as a Christian looks like. We need to educate and learn and model and express lament in, in these kinds of times, maybe more than any. And one of the maybe encouraging things that I've experienced across these difficult days is the ways that uh, that we've been leaning in to this posture of expressing our sorrow and grief and uh, to provide language and space and opportunities to share that lament, to give people permission that it's okay to cry out to God in our, in our confusion, in our sorrow, in our loss. We're grieving things. Uh, we're experiencing loss, and we need to have permission to express that and to find new ways to offer lament ourselves uh, to the Lord. And so as we think about that, I, I'm reminded of uh, the important work of, of uh, Pauline Boss, Dr. Pauline Boss, who's Professor Emeritus from the University of Minnesota. And uh, her work with, uh, in clinical psychology and her work with uh, working with uh, family members with dementia, her, and her work especially with the concept of what she calls ambiguous loss. Ambiguous loss is when someone is physically absent but psychologically present, or is physically present but psycholog psychologically absent. It is a form of frozen grief. Uh, we don't know what we're experiencing always at first when we're naming these things, and, and when we can finally realize that the loss we're experiencing, even though it's not the loss perhaps of, of the finality of death, is still a loss that we grieve and mourn. And this kind of frozen grief where we're stuck and we are uncertain and we don't know what comes next. And there are, is a whole range of areas of loss that we often overlook. And we're experiencing one of those, I think, right now in this time of physical distancing and, and uh, in this pandemic that we experience. And whether or not that's the loss of, of freedom or the loss of, of abilities or the loss of a loved one due to a, a dementia or Alzheimer's, the, uh, the loss of a child who is away and distant from us, the loss of a senior experience that we had hoped and longed for, whatever the loss in our life, it is a cause to lament. And so we need to affirm lament as a needed act. It is something that we need to experience together in these days. We need to affirm lament as a faithful act. Uh, this, is, this is an act of great trust and faithfulness. And if nothing else, if we could uh, come through this time and acknowledge that when we lament, we are being faithful to our relationship with God, faithful to our experience as believers, uh, that uh, we also would want to affirm lament as a confessional act. And by that, I mean that it is an act that causes us to intercede, to pray, and to intercede on behalf of, of others.
lament can take also the form of repentance, repentance for corporate and systemic sin, co confession and lamenting issues of, of social injustice and racial uh, reconciliate the need for racial reconciliation and a whole range of social issues. We lament when we weep the tears of the world, when we cry with people all across this globe who are going through situations, the situations that we find ourselves in. And so it is a, a needed and a faithful and a confessional act, an act of, of offering God our, our deepest cries. But it is also a holistic act. It's in response to tragedy and trauma, but it's also in response to other loss, uh, to the kinds of ambiguous loss that we uh, mentioned a moment ago. That when we think about all the ranges of, of areas of loss in our lives, whenever we experience loss, may we quickly know that what we can respond with is the prayer of lament. There's a couple of resources I wanted just to name in closing, and then I want to share one more psalm of lament as a closing prayer. Um, I've been working over the last number of years trying to collect lament resources, and they're available, uh, and it's a work in progress, but available on a website uh, called sacredsorrow.org. The link is in Canvas as well. And then I also work with a Facebook uh, group called The Sympathizing Tear, which is a place to share, again, resources and prayers and issues of lament. And I uh, would encourage you maybe in the days to come as we experience uh, all that we're going through, that perhaps we are given lament for such a grief as this, for such a time that we're experiencing right now in our world and in our lives. And so as we close, I'd like to just share another Psalm of lament as a prayer. It's Psalm 6. Hear the word of the Lord again. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are shaking with terror. My soul is also struck with terror, while you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, save my life. Deliver me for the sake of your steadfast love. For, there, for in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who can give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. They grow weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and struck with terror. They shall turn back and in a moment be put to shame. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be to God. May we offer our lament in the name of the man of sorrows acquainted with grief and experience the gift that the scriptures give us of lament for such a grief as this. Amen. Thank you, John. We appreciate those words this morning. We do have about five minutes here uh, for, for those who might want to share a, a comment or a question. Uh, and I, I would invite you to either submit that in the, in the chat box or if there would be those who would like to actually uh, share a word, uh, then you could just raise your hand and uh, I can uh, make it possible for you to speak. That's virtually raising your hand. There should be a button to do that. Uh, but John, while you were speaking, we did get one question uh, that uh, happens to come from my wife, that being incidental, I suppose. But she said, I feel like people are generally afraid to complain to God. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think one of our struggles is that we've, again, not seen lament and even complain as a faithful act. And because we take the emotions we're feeling, whatever they are, because we take them to God, it's an act of prayer. And it's an act of worship because it's acknowledging who God is in relationship to what I'm experiencing. And when I take any emotion I'm feeling, whether it's anger, and the psalmists don't hold back, right? They take full-on rage to God. They take fear, complaint, confusion, questions to God. And so I think the psalms tell us that it's a faithful act. And I think that the reason that we tend not to do that is either we think God can't handle it, or we think that somehow it speaks ill of our relationship uh, or our faithfulness as a Christian because we've bought into the assumption that, that only when things are going well do, you know, and I praise God and I'm in modes of celebration, um, but God asks for our heart in every tone, in every key, in every emotion, uh, that both in funeral and fiesta, we offer ourselves to God. 
-hmm. and, and I think we've also just, we are uncomfortable with our feelings, our, any negative emotional feeling, sorrow, grief, anger. One of the, one of the telltale signs of that, and I have a 100% response rate to this question, and I've asked it for, been asking it for 10 years. You know, when in, for example, a corporate worship setting, if someone begins to cry, what is the first thing almost inevitably they will say? Um, and it is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And that tells me we have a problem, you know, that we haven't, we haven't owned this as a faithful act. And so I think we somehow have gotten it backwards that to share negative emotion somehow means I don't, I'm not a person of faith. Hmm. And, and my biggest takeaway from this work is that lament is a faithful act. We take it to God. And so it's prayer, it is worship. And it's, it's the faithful act of, of the person that says, what I'm experiencing, I have only, you know, it's like Peter, who else, to whom else can we go? We take that to God. Yeah. Uh, Nick, you have a question. Would you like to share that with us? Let's see, Nick, I, I'm not hearing you. No, I still don't, I still don't hear you, Nick. Um, maybe you better write your question in the chat box. Okay. Oh, there. Oh, we wait, there you were. You <laughs> came back. All right. <laughs> there it is. Hey, uh, Nick. It's that mute button. Uh, it'll get you every time. Uh, John, thank you for your presentation. Um, and uh, very beautiful and sobering at the same time. Um, my, my question is, you really brought to my attention um, how easy it is uh, for us to think of lament as something we do individually. And I'm wondering if you could speak more on, you know, what does it mean to practice lament communally? Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, that's one of my, my deep passions. And, and I know, you know we've discovered, we've rediscovered lament over the probably the last 50 years in terms of biblical scholarship, right? And we understand it as a biblical form. Uh, and then over the last maybe 10 years, we've been naming it as a needed practice individually. Uh, but every place I, I turn in the literature and conversations that I have, what inevitably we, we come up against is that we still don't know how to do this well together. And so, you know, the, the focus of some work that I did a number of years ago was on trying to develop practices of corporate lament for the local church, for the local parish. And again, I think it involves giving permission for one another to do that, naming it is a, is a step, but giving space and a language and opportunities to express that. So I encourage, you know, pastors, for example, to give space you know, and certainly there are certain seasons that we can do that. I think Lent, Holy Week, Advent are some times. But what does it mean to even in regular worship to be able to give space where people can offer their sorrow? Um, there's a wonderful little song by Michael Card, Come Lift Up Your Sorrow, uh, Come Lift Up Your Pain, Make a, sac a Sacrifice of All Your Shame. Um, it goes on. But the, the idea is that, again, this is an offering. And so if in gatherings of corporate worship, in small group settings, in prayer times, if we can give people permission, space, and opportunity to name sorrow, to name grief, to name their laments, their questions, and again, to do it in a safe space that, that no one thinks that you're not a good Christian because you're asking these questions of God. Um, you know, so to create space and opportunity to give people permission and a language and, and an opportunity to express lament, I think is vitally important and something we're still figuring out. And the reality is we just don't do this well yet. And we've, we've got to you know, I think practice it and just do it. It's, you know, it's not going to always be pretty. It's, you know, it's, it's full of emotion. You know, it's, it's sometimes putting, being able, to, letting people see us when we're not at, you know, sort of our mask front that we put out there best all the time. Um, and so that requires trust in, in community as well. Um, but I think we've got to learn the hard work of doing this together. Great. Well, John, thank you. Uh, again, for sharing with us this morning and for helping to helping to open this day on what is clearly a, an appropriate note for us, uh, that even as we continue to, to celebrate this opportunity to be together, uh, that we recognize that we do so in, in the midst of, of tremendous loss and, and, and grief. Uh, so uh, thank you for helping us to, to be able to do that more faithfully. We are going to shift gears at this point uh, and uh, move into our, our first set of student papers. Uh, and I'm uh, particularly uh, 
pleased to be able to introduce this morning uh, our three uh, history seniors who are going to be presenting uh, the work that they have done in the context of their uh, senior thesis work. So I'm going to just say a word here uh, about each of them uh, and then uh, they'll present their papers. Uh, again, just a, a reminder uh, that if you have questions that you'd like to be contributing, uh, there's no need to wait uh, to be queued for that. You can always be uh, chiming in on the, on the chat or if you have, again, you know, private questions that you think they might want to answer in written form, use the, use the Q&A box. Uh, but first up this morning will be Stephen Ingersoll, uh, history education and pre-law student here at ENC. Uh, his paper is entitled The Origins and Rise of Antisemitism During the Interwar Period. Uh, after that will be uh, Maddie Morin, or Madison Morin, uh, who's uh, also a history education major. Her paper is entitled Government and God, The Great Debate as Seen Through the Political Work of John Adams. And then uh, last up will be Theodore Ronane, uh, speaking about China as the premier threat to the U.S. in Southeast Asia during the Cold War. So thanks to all three of you. Uh, for being with us this morning. Looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, but Stephen, the floor, as they say, is yours. All right, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. So I did my paper on anti-Semitism in the US specifically during the interwar period, which is the period between around 1920 to the start of World War II in 1939. Um, this is a topic I've interacted with in several classes, and I was always interested about um, how anti-Semitism manifested itself in the United States and some of the underlying causes of it. So um, when I was looking at my paper, I wanted to pick this particular um, point in history because it was um, it's widely regarded as the time where anti-Semitic rhetoric and actions were the highest in the history of the United States. Um, looking at this, I, I then wanted to examine what were some of the causes and underlying roots of anti-Semitism and why um, did it present itself during this time period. On April 26, 1913, an American child worker named Mary Fajan was strangled to death in a factory cellar in Atlanta, Georgia. Although there was not much evidence linking him to the case, Jewish factory owner Leo Frank was accused and convicted of the murder and sentenced to capital punishment. However, this sentence was later changed to life in prison. This new verdict did not sit well with many Georgians who did not like the idea of a Jew killing an American girl and walking free. Two years later, on August 16, 1915, Frank was kidnapped from prison and lynched in Marietta, Georgia. While his death itself was a tragedy, historians unanimously agree that Frank did not, in fact, commit the murder. They also agree that his murder was largely inspired by anti-Semitic sentiment. Sadly, this action was not an isolated case, nor was it a turning point in US relations and thoughts about Jews. Rather, in the years following, anti-Semitism reached new heights, particularly during the interwar period. Many U.S. periods are rife with anti-Semitic legislation, perspectives, and actions, but the interwar period, the time between world, the end of World War I and the beginning of World War II, was a time with the strongest anti-Jewish attitudes and actions. So my paper looked at why this was the case. So eventually what I reached was that anti-Semitism uh, in the United States during the interwar period had two main influences. There were deeply rooted historic anti-Semitic beliefs that were brought over by immigrants to the United States. And there was also a unique convergence of factors in the United States that led to this rise in anti-Semitism at the turn of the 20th century. So first I looked into what were some of the events um, during the interwar period that had anti-Semitic influence. One of the first thing I looked at was the prevalence of anti-Semitic writings. There were uh, several influential features, um, sorry, several influential people 
who contributed to this. One of the most notable was Henry Ford, who was um, an avid anti-Semite. Um, following the Bolshevik Revolution, there was a growth in anti-Semitic writings because there was a fear that the Jews were actually linked to the Bolsheviks and they were going to bring these philosophies to the United States. Another influential book called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion was, uh, came out in the late 19th century. And this was linked to um, some of the myths about Jews controlling the economy and the government. And there was a lot of fear with that. Um, there were several immigration legislations that were passed, which directly targeted the areas many Jews came from, notably at this time, Eastern Europe. Then the third factor, third main event during the interwar period was the rise of anti-Semitic groups, um, particularly the reemergence of the Ku Klux Klan and the German American Bund. So then in my paper, I transitioned into looking at the causes of anti-Semitism and some of the roots that led to this rise during the interwar period. The first thing I looked at was a history of anti-Semitism. So in the US, there were three factors that, um, that contributed to the, the history of anti-Semitism. Um, one was an international factor. Um, anti-Semitism, as we understand it today, began in the second century CE, um, mainly with the emergence of Christianity as one of the dominant religious forces in Europe. Um, it, this is kind of tragic, but because of the close connection between Judaism and Christianity, Christians felt very threatened by the idea that the Jews might be able to disprove the story of Jesus or be able to overturn um, some of the, the power in that. So they became um, very anti-Jewish. As um, Europe developed and as Christianity became more powerful, there were other myths that developed, um, stories about Jews causing the Black Death, um, participating in Black magic. And then um, eventually during the 17th and the 18th centuries, that transitioned away from simply being a religious thing to becoming more secularized. So Jews were blamed for, um, for like economic issues, for failures in certain wars, such as the Franco-Prussian War. And they were also accused of having certain physical and mental differences from other Europeans. In the United States, this history began in uh, the first Jews to record it to have migrated to the United States were in 1654 in what today would be New York City. Um, Jews were discriminated against, um, and we can see this in writings and actions as soon as the 18th century. Um, they were seen as untrustworthy, scheming, and even dangerous. Um, as Jewish immigration increased into the 19th century, um, Jews attempted to be integrated with American culture. And in US immigration history, we see a pattern where new immigrants will come over, um, such as the Irish or the Italians. They often will be marginalized and not accepted. And then eventually they'll be um, integrated into American culture. Interestingly with the Jews, um, this was not the case. They, were, they continued to be discriminated against even hundreds of years after they first migrated to the United States. And so then the, uh, the second part of that outside of the history were the unique factors in the United States that contributed to this anti-Semitism. The first one I looked at was um, the, the, the position of dominance that Christian Protestantism had in the US. This began early on with um, the, the founding of colonies such as Plymouth, um, which were largely um, made out of, for religious reasons, and so that people could have religious freedom to some degree, but these were largely Protestant dominated, and they, they very much wanted to control what people believed, and the, they wanted to put um, Christianity in a position of power there. Um, they often discriminated against native religions, they forcibly convert them, destroy their artifacts, their burial grounds, and things like that. Um, uh, there were many other groups that were discriminated against. Anti-Catholicism was one of the was strongest anti-religious forces um, during the 17 and 1800s. Um, and this can be seen as a result of the strength of the Protestant position in the United States. Later on, I go to look at the Mormons, who are another group. They were discriminated against in immigration policy and laws. For instance, the Edmonds Act, um, which targeted polygamy 
was um, directly targeting the Mormon practice of polygamy. This is an example of religious discrimination. Um, I, my paper also examined briefly um, the history of Muslim immigration and some of the policies and legislation that targeted them. So these are all examples of anti-religious acts by Protestants, which enabled anti-Semitism during the interwar period. The second factor identified was the tendency of nativism. So uh, nativism is defined by Webster as a policy of favoring native inhabitants as opposed to immigrants. However, for my paper, a more helpful understanding of nativism could be found in nativist rhetoric from the history of the United States. In the 1850s, a popular statement from nativists was that uh, nativism was, quote, to restore America to the Americans, to purify and strengthen this nation, and to keep it clean from corruption, end quote. This is talking about different immigrants who are bringing in other cultural aspects into the United States that nativists didn't like. So there was an idea amongst Americans that the country was losing its identity and nativism sought to correct this. The term was coined in the 1840s, but roots of the movement stretched back to the late 18th century with actions such as the, Nat the Naturalization Act of 1790. Um, and this stated that citizens must be, quote, free white persons and have good moral character, end quote. So this was saying that only um, free white people could be citizens in the United States, which is clearly a discriminatory policy. Um, Anti-Catholicism, which I previously mentioned, was an anti-religious movement, but also it was political in nature. Um, there, were, there was a fear that the United States would be fundamentally changed by Catholic immigrants, and this translated into anti-Catholic laws and legislation, and there was also much violence against priests and nuns and other people of the Catholic Church. So nativism grew, especially with the increase of immigration during the 19th century. Um, immigrants were often seen as dirty, poor, and criminally inclined, as well as un-American. Um, uncertainty stemming from the Civil War in the 1860s was also a big factor in the growth of nativism. Um, this can be seen in the Chinese Exclusion Acts during that century and other restrictive immigration legislation. So nativism wasn't strictly linked to immigration policy, but this is one way we see that um, right before the turn of the 20th century. The third thing I looked at was anti-Semitic myths that were present in the United States. Um, these are still things that we can see today. One of the most popular is that um, there's some conspiracy that Jews control the government and the economy. Um, this was a big fear of people in the United States in the 19th and 20th centuries. They believed that they were, um, Jews were somehow running the economy. Um, this goes back to like powerful families such as the Rothschilds. This is a myth that stretches back all the way to the, the 10th and 11th centuries in Europe. There was also the idea that Jews were practicing um, black magic and things like that. So these were some of the factors that led to the rise of anti-Semitism during the interwar period. Um, we can see from modern connections, there were many consequences of this rise in anti-Semitism. Even today, um, anti-Semitism continues to be a factor in the United States and um, in places such as France. Um, the, the other connections we can see were in um, the era before World War II, where um, the United States rejected many immigrants, especially Jews, from um, fleeing Germany and other Nazi-controlled areas. Um, this was largely out of uh, anti-Semitic belief and discrimination against immigrants um, due to the rise of nativism and other groups such as the Ku Klux Klan. So um, that, was the, uh, that was kind of the scope of my paper and it sought to address why anti-Semitism was on the rise during this period in American history. Thank you, Stephen. Some excellent work there. Uh, so, uh, as before, I want to invite all of you to submit uh, questions uh, for Stephen in the chat box um, or, uh, or using the Q&A function. Uh, and if you'd like, we have a minute here, uh, then we could have, uh, you could raise your hand, uh, your virtual hand, and we'll uh, give you an opportunity uh, to speak if you would like. Uh, Stephen, I 
figured I would get us started uh, by asking a little bit about uh, if you if you just, you kind of touched in kind of broad strokes on the uh, on the nature of this anti-Semitism, uh, but I was just wondering if you could uh, give us or or kind of which of the various kinds of explanations for anti-Semitic sentiment seem to have sort of the greatest prominence, right? Did, in other words, did anti-Semites mostly resort to kind of religious explanations or biological explanations uh, or, or something else? Like it was when in terms of why they thought Jews were a problem, did you see patterns in that? Well, um, before like the turn of the 20th century, it was largely um, a religious thing and also an anti-immigrant idea. So uh -huh. it largely targeted the fact that Jews had a different religious belief. This went back to the, um, the, the problems with Christianity that had been around for 1500 years where Judaism is closely related to Christianity and also poses the largest threat to their, their belief. Um, there were also the anti-immigrant ideas that Jews were poor and un-American and unruly and were negatively affecting the country. Um, as the U.S. transitioned into the progressive era and the early 20th century, there became the idea of race began to grow. And that's when Jews became racially targeted. So there was the idea that Jews were a different race and they were inferior or they had mental differences or they would never be integrated into the United States. So before the turn of the 20th century, it was largely an anti-religious and an anti-immigrant. Um, they were largely anti-religious and anti-immigrant ideals. As the as it transitioned into the 20th century, then it became more of a, a racial thing, which we could see later uh, manifest itself in um, World War II and the Holocaust. Great. Yeah. Does anybody else have Ah, here we go. Uh, Professor Matsko has a, a comment here. Uh, Stephen, I don't know if you're seeing it, but she says, uh, thanks for your analysis to the cause of anti-Semitic belief in the interwar period. Uh, she said, I might've missed this, but was there a specific issue or event uh, as to why it was, why it became especially strong in this specific period? Um, or, do, or do we just think that it was especially strong because of our awareness of what happens in Germany uh, and eventually in, in the context of the Holocaust. Uh, so yeah, is there something about this moment in time, this interwar period that, especially in America, brings this surge of anti-Semitism? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the thing we see during the interwar period was there was the most um, anti-Semitic writing that was available. I mentioned um, Henry Ford. He, um, he ran a newspaper um, called the Dearborn Independent, and it ran for, I think, three or four years, uh, four years, and it had about 72,000 readers uh, in 1920, um, and it was very anti-Semitic. It, um, it talked about how Jews were controlling and undercutting the economy, infiltrating political organizations, polluting religious groups, um, and it even... It even mentioned that Jews were inferior um, morally. So um, one of the things we see during the interwar period is the it was the height of anti-Semitic writing. So that's one of the ways we identify it because those are the artifacts that we have nowadays. Mm -hmm. we, we don't necessarily know what people were saying, but we can see what they were writing at the time. Mm -hmm. There were also the highest recorded um, anti-Semitic actions. So for instance, like in large cities such as Chicago and New York, there were a lot of beatings of Jews. Um, uh, simply because they were Jewish and people believed that they were having negative effects on the United States. That would go back to the rise in nativism. So that's another thing we can identify. Um, the story of Leo Frank is one of those that occurred slightly before the interwar period um, in 1913, but it was, there were a lot of other examples of things like that happening. Um, and tragically, uh, the story of Leo Frank did not uh, serve as a turning point that would actually come with the Holocaust, which is what it would take for anti-Semitism to be publicly decried. Um, the third thing we can see is there were two groups identified. The Ku Klux Klan reemerged in the 1920s. Um, it had been popular during the 19th century um, following the Civil War, but then it really reemerged. Um, they sought to protect the purity of America 
and pre prevent un-American ideals such as um, Judaism. So the, the rise of this group shows the sentiments that were um, around at the time. And then there was also the German American Bund, which was a pro-Nazi movement yeah. um, in, the, in the 1930s. So um, the emergence of groups like this. So those were a few of the factors that I identified um, as far as why anti-Semitism was the strongest during this period. I think another thing um, that I didn't explicitly state necessarily in my paper was that the idea of race began to develop during this time in the progressive era in the early 20th century, which led to people discriminating against Jews, not just because of religion or their immigrant status, but actually because of um, their race. Great. Stephen, thanks so much for your paper and, and for your very thoughtful presentation this morning. We'll turn now to our second presentation uh, from Madison Morin. So, Maddie, I'm getting your slides up here and ready for you, but the floor will, in just a moment, be yours. Okay. All right, so my paper is called uh, Government and God, the Great Debate as Seen Through the Political Work of John Adams. So um, you can just click to the next one in the introduction slide. Okay, as a historical figure, it is quite possible that none can stand quite so tall as John Adams, a man who refuses definition. He represents perhaps the foremost mind in the most formative and nebulous period in American history. He took pleasure in debate, in wrestling with hard truths, loudly, with little consideration for the feelings of those around him. He left behind a prolific record of documents, diaries, and letters that provide an access almost unheard of for a historical figure. But what can he tell us about his age? People often debate the validity of our government, of the choices that went into its birth, or the motivation and foundation underneath its creation. And one of the most hotly debated perspectives of this kind is the religious legacy of the founding. In the eyes of the men who wrote the articles of our government, where does religion fit in? For Adams, the answer becomes clear after analyzing three major documents written throughout his political life. In John Adams' eyes, religion and government did not ever have to clash. Liberty and morality, morality and religion, all these concepts twined together hand in hand. This essay will look deeply into political and personal documents written at various times throughout the life of John Adams to prove this idea. The di his, his dissertation on canon and feudal law written at the very cusp of the revolution in 1765, the Massachusetts Constitution as interpreted by historian John Woods Jr. written in 1780, and then a series of letters written to Thomas Jefferson in the twilight of Adam's life. Studying religion in the life of a man long dead can be a delicate process, but through his work, the ideas and beliefs of John Adams about God, religion, and liberty truly come alive across the centuries. So um, my historiography section. As a founding father, John Adams is one of the more underrepresented men of his age in overall historical scholarship, especially considering the wealth of sources available. Adams expressly asked that his family and descendants work to preserve his written papers and legacy. So his writings and those of his descendants were meticulously preserved by his children and subsequent generations. In the 1950s, these sources were transferred to over five miles of microfilm and historian Lyman Butterfield was able to reorganize and publish the documents for public use, fueling a revival of interest in this otherwise previously overlooked historical figure. Zoltan Harazzi's John Adams and the Prophets of Progress helped to, quote, enhance his place as a thinker, end quote, alongside men like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. Manning Dower and Stephen Kurtz both published books on Adams' years in the presidency that reestablished him as a distinguished federalist politician in greater historical consciousness. And in 1959, a book by Lester J. Capone titled The Adams Jefferson Letters cataloged the extensive correspondence between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and helped return Adams to his position of prominence as the intellectual sparring partner of America's great revolutionary author. In the mid-1970s, a miniseries called The Adams Chronicles was produced by PBS, documenting the entire Adams legacy, making the Adams family narrative accessible to a much wider public audience for the first time. More recent scholarship includes the book Passionate, Passionate Sage, The Character and Legacy of John Adams, written by J. Joseph Ellis and published in 1993, and the widely read biography John Adams by David McCullough, published in 2001, which was also actually developed into a miniseries by HBO in 2008. 
So I'm going to dive into the cultural and religious context of John Adams. Um, the Adams family found their way to the New World by way of John's grandparents, Henry and Edith, who immigrated to the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1638, following the promise of new land and a new start. In her book, Household Gods, The Religious Lives of the Adams Family, historian Sarah Giorgini argues that Henry was following the call of Providence to bring his family across the sea after experiencing religious tension in his homeland and hearing sermons that promised good fortune and the blessing of God to those who followed in his footsteps. And of course, the, the idea of Providence guiding the early settlers, guiding the early settlers to the shores of the New World was not a concept unique to the Adams clan. Many of the American colonies were founded with grand mantras that the Lord had blessed their occupation and endeavors, and none more than those in, New Eng in the New England region, particularly Massachusetts Bay, John Winthrop's City on a Hill. Giorgini argues that this providential legacy was passed through the subsequent generations all the way down to John, and it became the primary religious lens through which he and his wife, Ab his wife Abigail would interpret the world. Giorgini traces the connection that both Adams would attempt to draw between the high romantic past of their Puritan ancestors and the world that, it, that they existed in during the 1760s and 70s. When, quote, when John Adams drafted his dissertation on the canon of feudal law in the summer of 1765, it was the idealized memory of Puritans like his great grandfather that guided his pen. John was confident that his Puritan ancestor exemplified what any good colonist could dare when acting in concert with God's will, end quote. But culturally, culturally, John could not escape the European ideas that were sweeping west at the time. Adams was distinctly shaped by the Enlightenment movement, which had begun in Europe under the pen of men like John Locke and Voltaire. His understanding of human rights, particularly as human rights being innate and God-given, as will be discussed later, stem directly from these influences. The Enlightenment marked a shift in scholarship in the West at large, carrying forward the study of the great humanists of ancient Greece and Rome as in the Renaissance, which John took to with gusto. He was an avid reader and admirer of the great Roman orators and would often quote from Latin or Greek texts directly into his diaries and letters. This age of reason plays interestingly into the study of religion in a man's life, most of the great thinkers of the time were not concerned with the sacred, and deism thrived among the intelligentsia of the period. The popular religious perspective was of a god that may or may not be present, who in any case had little to nothing to do with the day-to-day -day operation of the universe. This context, both of a hometown and upbringing steeped in the Protestant religion, yet a secular culture almost just as far removed, casts a very interesting light on the study of interaction on the study of the interaction of religion and politics in John Adams' life. The, so the dissertation on canon and feudal law. Written in 1765, it's the next slide. There we go. Written in 1765, Adams' dissertation on the canon and feudal law could be named as one of his earliest revolutionary writings. The paper itself is a product of its context. The first half very much a lawyer's historical analysis of the history and foundations of his own profession. The second half, however, marks a tonal shift in the work that truly displays Adam's reaction to his time. He writes in grand terms, rising to the, rising to the defense of education and liberty, speaking against the passage and enforcement of the Stamp Act in the colonies. His ideas become less of an intellectual analysis on the origins and purpose of law and more of a pointed attack aimed to challenge what he saw as an injustice imposed on his homeland. Though the paper is not specifically about religion by any means, it offers many key insights into the first few public revolutionary thoughts of John Adams and the way he chose to weave together his beliefs and his active responses to circumstance. The final version of the essay was published in four parts in the Boston Gazette um, throughout the late summer and fall of um, 1765. So, how did the young lawyer from Boston see the relationship between his religious beliefs and his life's work? One can start to see the connections that Adams began to make between liberty and spirituality. However, he begins his essay with a rather scathing indictment of organized religion, the Catholic Church, or as he puts it, quote, Romish clergy specifically. However, rather than attack the, the canon on a doctrinal level, Adams makes an interesting pivot pointing to the relationship he saw between liberty and autonomy and the roles that these concept, concepts played in religion, religious expression. 
Instead of typical Protestant criticisms, John Adams chooses to indict the Romish church for, quote, infusing into the people a religious horror of letter and knowledge, end quote. Therefore, the greatest evil that they committed was not necessarily one of doctrinal in, um, doctrinal interpretation, but of intellectual oppression. He writes, thus was human nature chained fast for ages in a cruel, shameful, and deplorable servitude to him and his subordinate tyrants in a state of um, total ignorance of everything divine and human. Um, the idea of something, the idea of government as something simple or comprehensible by the everyday educated man makes an appearance multiple times throughout the dissertation. Here, one can start to see the strong influences of the humanism and enlightenment thinkers that Adams would come to name as his contemporaries. Just as Jefferson would cite Locke's natural rights and the Declaration of Independence over 10 years later, Adams also plays with the terms um, in his own right here, again, offering interesting insight into his religious views. For Locke and Adams, the natural rights of, natural rights of man were innate, God-given and indisputable. And many times throughout this dissertation, John makes this belief known. In his very first section, Adams writes of the dangers of the canon and feudal law system stripping from the general public their rights. He explains in no uncertain terms his meaning, saying, quote, rights that cannot be repealed or restrained by human laws, rights derived from the great legislator of the universe. Not only does he mimic the sentiment of the thinkers of his time, he also makes a direct comparison between God and government, naming the source of man's natural rights as, quote, the great legislator of the universe, end quote. This title he assigns to God implies much about his beliefs in the higher world. Um, the Massachusetts Constitution. In an essay titled One Public Religion, Many Private Religions, John Witt Jr. offers his own commentary on John Adams' particular blend of religion and politics. Using the Massachusetts Constitution, which was drafted by Adams in 1780, he proposed he proposes Adams had a relatively moderate view of the role religion was to play in society. As his title suggests, Witt argues that Adams maintained the importance of religious freedom written into the politics of society, while of a society, while still advocating for a small degree of pluralism in the private lives of individuals. Witt argues that Adams understood religion as a way to keep the community and those who would choose to serve in public office from falling into the trap of self-interest and self-promotion. In, in analyzing how Adams specifically pursued this balance between government and state in the 1780 Massachusetts Constitution, Witt divides his approach into three basic sections. Um, um, let's see, I lost my place, I'm sorry. And he then goes on to tackle Adams support for a public religion saying, quote, as Adams set out his views in the Constitution, the public was, religion was to be established First, ceremonially, ceremonially, second, morally, and third, institutionally. Witt goes on to pick out reasons for a moral establishment of religion, which Adams made very clear throughout his writings on the relationship of politics and religion. In referring to the moral obligations imposed by religion, Adams wrote, a frequent, quote, a frequent recurrence to the fundamental principles of the Constitution and a constant adherence to those of piety, justice, moderation, temperance, industry, and frugality are absolutely necessary to preserve the advantages of liberty and to main, maintain a free government, end quote, emphasizing his, idea of the, uh, emphasizing his idea of the role of religion as a kind of built-in compass for society, a way to measure action and policies against some greater good. Um, yes. Then we can move on to the Adams-Jefferson letters as the final section. Throughout his life, John Adams left a prolific record of letters to innumerable recipients. However, his correspondence with, correspondence with John Thomas Jefferson is perhaps the most insightful and rich of all, and rich of all. This is why looking in particular for Adams' perspective on religion and government, these letters are the ideal choice. The first letter dated the 28th of June, 1813, had been written early in their correspondence. Um, John was responding, telling Jefferson about a letter he had received from the young men of Philadelphia in 1798, so almost 10, over 10 years earlier. In his answer to Jefferson, Adams makes an interesting jump. Rather than choose to directly ascribe the loyalty of the young men to liberty or independence first as the great principles of the nation, Adams states, quote, 
The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the only principles in which that beautiful assembly and young gentlemen could unite. And these principles, wait, what am I saying? What were these principles? I answer, the general principle is Christianity in which all those sects were united, end quote. Adams argues that it was religion first, particularly Christianity that was the common ground underneath the formation of the group of young patriots, then listing, quote, English and American liberty. In his second letter written on April 19, 1817, John offers another um, perspective on religion and society, one rather more hopeful than um, he is given credit. Um, Through analysis of some of his other work, particularly his perspective in the Massachusetts Constitution, one may lead one to believe that John Adams thought of religion as only the moral force keeping humanity from killing each other. But this letter suggests more of a hopeful perspective. He equates religion with the conscience and with something innate and natural to mankind, not something that we must bend around and underneath, but as a, great, as a guide for our great passions and poultry interests. And then the conclusion. Though we may never know the true nature of anyone's religious beliefs without the benefit of speaking to them directly, we can try to come as close as possible through the written record that they leave us after they are gone. And for the study of John Adams, there is so much more than analyzed here for the curious reader to pursue. But even through such a small snapshot, a dim picture of a man begins to emerge. John Adams believed in liberty, in justice, and had a fierce hope for the future of his young country. He made it his life's work to build a system that could last for generations, to ensure that the great American experiment could continue for years to come. He believed that religion formed a basic part of the human soul, and as such should be a basic consideration for the formation of the human society. Quite the opposite of a rigid code of behavior, a set of rules by which to live one's life, Adam saw religion as a set of principles gifted to humanity by God, an inherent part of our nature, just as important and necessary as the right to living free. Living free. For John, liberty and morality, legality and principle, government and religion, all worked in tandem in the end. The end. Right. Thanks, Maddie. Great work. Uh, does anyone have a, a question or two for Maddie? We're a little pinched for time, but want to leave the floor open if anyone would like to submit one in the chat box or uh, offer offer a, a comment. Maddie, it's risky, but <laughs> I'll I'll ask you. Do you, do you suppose do you suppose John Adams would have would have anything to say to uh, specifically to sort of current discourse today about sort of the role of, of religion in in public life? Do you suppose he would he would have a clear view that would be familiar to us? Um, like. Like, would what would he say about people's, like? Well, obviously, there's a wide range of views, right, on yeah. on how religion figures in in public life, um, and and what, if any, reference to God belongs in, again in sort of the public sphere. Uh, so I just wonder, you know, do you, do you think Adams would have a, a did you discern something that you think would be kind of Adam's position on that question? Based on his, like, based on the Massachusetts Constitution, I would say if he were to make, like, a public comment, it would probably be somewhere along the lines of, I don't know if I mentioned in the presentation, but I talked about it in my paper, where religion publicly it really only does, should act as, like, a, like, a, like, a ruler, like it, religion, uh, it's not a perspective that is appreciated and not necessarily true, but a lot of people view religion as like a set of rules. And if you break them, you're bad, but if you keep them, you're good. And like, that's obviously very simplistic and not at all Adams's whole picture of religion. But I think if he were to make a statement about the role of religion in public life specifically, like that's how he would view it. Like in the Massachusetts Constitution, he doesn't choose to leave religion out completely. Like it's, I think it's one of 
like only two or three original state constitution so he keeps it in there but he it as something like like we're gonna have this set you have the freedom and um like what you believe about god i also mentioned in my paper too that his perspective is inherently like Maddie, Different. unfortunately, it seems like we've, we've lost Maddie's reception of here. Massachusetts in like 1778. And uh, so Maddie, I'm going to have to cut you off. Uh, but uh, I would, uh, Maddie, I don't know if you saw, but there is another question for you in the Q&A box, which I would love for you to write a response uh, to, to that question. But in the meantime, we do need to go ahead and pivot to uh, Theodore Ronane and to his paper on uh, Chinese-American relations in the Cold War. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, just trying to figure out this screen share thing right now. Let's see. So. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Uh, I'm going to be going over um, China is the premier threat to the U.S. and Southeast Asia during the Cold War. Essentially, my topic goes over um, the power relationship between the U.S. and China because it's very much an underexplored topic. Um, oftentimes, when people think of the Cold War, they think of Vietnam, Korea, and some other uh, very widely understood conflicts that involve the U.S. directly. However, as with, the, as with the rest of the Cold War, there was a face-off of sorts between the U.S. and China, which oftentimes goes unexplored in many cases because it involved a lot more soft power. Uh, there weren't so many U.S. tanks faced off against Chinese tanks, like, for example, the images of the Cold War in Europe that we've come to understand and associate with the Cold War in Europe. But um, to lead off, the, the fall of the Chinese nationalist government in, the, in 1949 was a major um, shift in the U.S. understanding of how the Cold War in Asia was going to go. Um, it came as a shock. It really was not understood that um, Taiwan, as, it, as it's known today, the, the remnants of the Chinese government that existed from 1927 up until 1949, that they would fall. Um, there was understanding that the Cold War was gonna be more focused on Russia. However, um, with, the, with the rise of Mao Zedong and the Chinese communists, the US found itself outmatched in Asia as a continent. Um, the, the bulk of uh, the resources from my paper involve uh, intelligence assessments declassified from uh, the Cold War, and one that really did catch my eye was actually the earliest one I was able to find from 1951 with the Central Intelligence Agency, that the Chinese communists are following a course of action, uh, course of action designed to destroy U.S. strategic interests in the Far East and to reduce the worldwide position of the U.S. and its allies. Now, uh, 1951, um, the, the Korean War was going on, and Essentially, for those who aren't very familiar with how the Cold War was going, uh, the U.S. was expecting to win. Uh, General MacArthur, who was very famous for his campaign in the Philippines during the Pacific in World War II, he had actually pushed. Um, he landed in South Korea at a few small beaches, which was all that was left of the South Korean government. Um, let's see, I don't know if you guys can see the mouse, but uh, I don't have a pointer. But essentially, in the little, uh, if you look at South South Korea, I understand the map is small and I apologize for that. There was a very small little uh, area in the Southwest that MacArthur's forces landed on and they pushed the, uh, the North Koreans essentially back to the North Korean border with China. However, um, half a million Chinese forces crossed um, the Daddy, North Korea. can Korean I interrupt for just a second? Yes. I'm very sorry, but what we're seeing is just your title slide and your browser. I think maybe you selected the, the wrong window to share. 
so can you um, try again on the sharing feature? Yes, to sure thing. Actually, bring up your um, your presentation. Yeah, my apologies. I'm bad at this stuff. Um, let's see. Is this better or is it the same thing? There we go. Now we're seeing now we're seeing your actual presentation. Thank you. Oh, okay. I, I apologize. So um, without right. without going back and uh, waste and wasting some time, but essentially um, half a million Chinese troops crossed the North Korean um, border and that was a major shock to the United States, which had anticipated a favorable outcome in the Korean War. And this is a trend that continues actually throughout the Cold War, and that moment actually defined U.S.-Chinese relations throughout the, for the rest of the Cold War. Um, taking, a, taking a step back and comparing the United States and China uh, demographically, um, and especially compared to the USSR, which, was, which many people consider to be the premier threat to the U.S. internationally during the Cold War, uh, the USSR and its, all of its allies basically comprised 8% of the world's population. China alone, at the time in 1951, had 23% of the world's population. And on top of this, the USSR and China were very strong allies at this point. Uh, basically, Russia had issued guarantees for the People's Republic of China that if the West tried to intervene, then nuclear weapons were on the table. Um, and the Chinese military was 10 million strong compared compared to the US in the same year was only 3 million strong. So militarily, the US was on the back foot for in Asia during the Cold War. And this would define just about every single conflict the US got involved in, as I'm going to later go into with Vietnam. Um, but let's see, sorry, I kind of um, outpaced myself with my paper. Um, so going back to Taiwan, um, Many people aren't familiar with the with the Chinese uh, Taiwan relations that occurred throughout the uh, throughout the Cold War. However, uh, China constantly would basically try to take little pieces of Taiwan and test the U.S. limits to its relationship. Um, for example, there were several Taiwan Strait crises. One in one in fifty. Uh, yeah, one in the early 1950s, one in 1968, and another one in the 1990s. And for those who aren't familiar with Taiwan, because it's not very widely known at all, 30,000 U.S. troops were stationed in China at this point. And during these Taiwan Strait crises, uh, basically the Chinese would try and take a small group of islands that are in between mainland China and Taiwan. And there was roughly about 400 um, Taiwanese troops that were killed each time, and they would provoke a U.S. response. And sorry, I kind of I kind of lost myself. I'm I'm very bad at this kind of stuff. Um, the the Chinese, yes, they seized the Dachen and Yingsheng Islands, and the U.S. Navy had to evacuate. And they own and the Chinese only halted their advance. It was their intention to take all of Taiwan when the U.S. passed the Formosa Re Resolution in 1955. For those who don't know, Formosa was what Taiwan was formerly known as. Uh, it was a part of um, China for a long time until the end of the Chinese Civil War when it became home to its own government. Um, and the United States formed the, the United States Taiwan Defense Command and would also form the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization as an attempt to um, prevent Chinese aggression in the region. However, um, moving into my next slide, um, I'm gonna probably be back, moving back and forth between this slide. Um, so Southeast Asia Treaty Organization um, and the Un United States Taiwan Defense Command, those are the two images located there. And these attempts were um, rather unsuccessful by the US to actually prevent the Chinese from pursuing their political aims in the region. So for those who aren't familiar with the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, it was, it was an attempt to recreate the Northeast uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization in Asia. It involved several major powers, England, France, and Australia, 
as well as Vietnam and let's see if I'm correct, Thailand was involved as well, uh, as well as a small uh, a few other small nations. However, they were never able to unify politically and they were never able to organize mutual defense. Um, this basically meant when China uh, eventually intervened in the Vietnam War, uh, there was, as well as backed um, rebellions in Laos, Cambodia, and also the Chinese military went into Myanmar, also known as Burma, to uh, basically attack the, um, sorry, the, the, the remnants of the Taiwanese military that was there. Uh, there was no response. While we're, while we're familiar with uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and other strong um, US shows of strength and attempt to mediate conflict resolution, that never happened in Southeast Asia. And this also, and the importance for all of this, by the way, is because it plays into modern, into actually current affairs, some of which are less than about three months old, which I will um, wrap up in my conclusion. But um, going over to Vietnam, because I realize I'm, I'm getting tight for time. Um, people aren't familiar with Chinese involvement in the Vietnam War. However, it was Chinese involvement in Vietnam actually defined it. Uh, for example, some people were vaguely familiar of, with uh, Chinese foreign aid to North Vietnam during, during the conflict. For example, they gave over $140 billion of today's money in military aid to North Vietnam, much of it for free, uh, meaning that the North Vietnamese did not have to pay anything back. But also, 320,000 Chinese forces were stationed in North Vietnam. This is important to understand because when looking at Vietnam, it doesn't play out the same way as Korea. The U.S. never crossed the demilitarized zone in Vietnam and went into the north to try and end the conflict. And as a result, the U.S. became bogged down and eventually did lose the war. And that begs the question of why. And the reason why is China, because 320,000 troops were stationed in North Vietnam. And also with that, they brought with them a plethora of modern technology comparative, in a sense, to U.S. Um, assets in the region. Um, for example, people might be familiar with Operation Rolling Thunder, the U.S. air campaign over North Vietnam. And it actually was a bloody affair for the Americans. They didn't achieve their, their aims, but they lost hundreds of aircraft. And of all those American planes shot down over North Vietnam, 38% were shot down directly by China, meaning that it wasn't North Vietnamese soldiers with Chinese equipment. It was Chinese troops in Chinese uniforms shooting down American planes. And this is the reason why um, this is one of, the, one of the many reasons why the U.S. was not able to achieve its aims in Vietnam, which eventually, with the fall of, of the U.S. position in South Vietnam and the withdrawal, eventually Laos and Cambodia would fall as well. Um, going back to uh, the, Chinese, uh, the, the intelligence assessment from the Central Intelligence Agency that I mentioned from 1951, there was an understanding within the various intelligence agencies of the United States that China was unable to be beaten in a major conflict. Um, for example, aside, aside from the um, military disparities in size and equipment between the U.S. and China, um, the infrastructure in China and communications networks were rather underdeveloped. So essentially, the U.S. found itself in a position during the during the entirety of the Cold War where they could just respond half-heartedly. Um, they were never able to threaten a military response to China in the same way that they were with the USSR uh, because the US did not have a powerful ally in the region. With, uh, for example, Australia is perhaps the only other truly modernized nation. Um, South Korea eventually joined this list, but South Korea um, developed Later, I want to say um, it's it wasn't a, an overnight process for South Korea to build up its military. Uh, looking at Australia and, and the U.S., were the only two nation Western nations with large military presences in the region. Um, taking a look back at Southeast Asia, um, the vast majority of countries involved: Thailand, um, Laos, Cambodia, Indonesia, and, and the and the Philippines. After they got their independence from the United States, were rather underdeveloped. So the U.S.
had to spread its forces thin, um, trying to maintain the peace across the region while the Chinese were able to keep their military rather centralized. Um, oh, I, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting close to the end, but um, basically with the fall of, with the fall of the U.S. position in South Vietnam, um, the U.S. actually was unable to intervene in the area for the, actually the rest of the Cold War. Um, little, it's, it's not very well known, but um, the, the Chinese actually invaded Vietnam in 1979 and overtook the Soviets on the world stage. The Soviets really wanted to, um, after, the, after the Sino-Soviet split of the 1960s, uh, ch basically China um, backed the communists in Cambodia and the Russians backed the North Vietnamese, which would now control all of Vietnam. However, when Vietnam um, went into Cambodia and overthrew the Khmer Rouge, the uh, Chinese actually invaded North Vietnam, killed several thousand um, Vietnamese soldiers, declared victory and left. And in those same years, they actually fought a small border war with the, with the USSR killing several thousand as well. Um, looking at the Cold War today, because it never ended, um, China and the US are actually currently in an arms race uh, like, for example, when you hear of like in the news, like vague talk about the F-35 stealth fighter, uh, the Chinese basically have a copy of it now or their own equivalent. Uh, the U.S. still doesn't have a powerful ally in the region. We're still finding ourselves outmatched and we're unable to build uh, military comparative forces to the Chinese. Espionage between the two countries remains widespread. I wasn't able to find many resources on it, but actually back in early January, if I'm correct, three U three people in the U.S. were actually arrested. Two of them, um, actually all three of them at Logan Airport, and one of them was the Harvard Chair for Chemical and Biological Studies, um, aiding Chinese government research and development. One was a Chinese intelligence officer, and the third was a Chinese national trying to smuggle 21 vials of biological related research out through Logan Airport as well. And this is also important because there's much talk with um, the South China Sea and the conflicts over there. There's a series of islands in the South China Sea that China currently is trying to stake claim to over the, over the small nations of the region as well. And the US is finding itself drawn in there by our series of alliances. And it's important to understand the relationship between China and the US and how China was never able to be effectively contained during the Cold War because it defines our relationship today. And it may very well define the next war that we fight. Anyway, thank you all for your time. I, I, appreci I, I appreciate your patience with my rough presentation. Thanks, Teddy. There's a lot of fascinating stuff in there. If people have questions for Teddy, we do have a, a couple of minutes here before we come to the end of our time. So please feel free to uh, set those in the, in the Q&A or chat boxes. Uh, Teddy, I wanted to ask uh, about the, the Vietnam context uh, specifically. Uh, you mentioned that uh, that China obviously was a was a critical ally for uh, for Vietnam in that context, and you had Chinese troops on the ground in North Vietnam. Yes. I wonder. I wonder. Was there any serious debate uh, in the context of uh, of American foreign policy circles about the the potential risks per versus potential reward? of a, a direct confrontation with China in that context. Did that get any serious traction uh, that you know of, or no, was that far too dangerous to contemplate? Not that I was able to find. Um, I'm sorry for not, for, for not saying it earlier, but by the time of, uh, of the Vietnam conflict, China had their own nuclear arsenal comparative to the USSR. And therefore, any handling of, of affairs involving China had to consider the fact that any major confrontation could spark a, could spark a war, potentially nuclear. Um, unfortunately, well, I'm, I'm gonna take out unfortunately because it's all subjective because it's history, but uh, generally speaking, I think from what I was able to find, the US took a very reactionary approach, meaning that wherever China shows up, we'll kind of show up and try and scare them off, but we can't really do much about them militarily. Great. Um, 
you did have you got another question here from Dr. Matsko, oh. uh, who who pointed out that of course there is still this very complicated relationship today uh, between mm -hmm. the U.S. and and China. So she was wondering, uh, as you look back on this period, is there any specific thing that you can see that the U.S. could have done differently in its responding to China that might have improved the relationship that we have with China today? Were there missed opportunities? Uh, in, that, in that Cold War context? That's very much a possibility. Uh, looking at the U.S. and uh, the People's Republic of China during the Cold War, um, the failure to recognize Mao's government in mainland China until the 1970s was a major slap in the face, as viewed by Mao. Um, however, I don't believe that the U.S. could ever uh, really reach a good understanding with uh, the Chinese uh, communists, largely because um, Mao was ideologically opposed to the United States and was rather unapologetic in that approach. Um, while, the, while the USSR would change leaders every now and then, for example, going from Stalin to Khrushchev, uh, all the way up to Brezhnev, and you, you reach uh, periods of like perestroika, basically like the the easing of tensions that never really happened with China, uh, at least so long as Mao and um, so long as Mao was in power. What I would say could have been done differently is if the U.S. Fa uh, was more effective with CETO, uh, trying to perhaps temper Chinese aggression and perhaps. Actually, I won't speak to trade between the two countries because I don't know, I don't have any research on that, but the, the U.S. could have posed a better military, a military response, not necessarily directly, but uh, building up enough power in the region to kind of keep the, the Chinese communists from basically wreaking havoc all over Southeast Asia, which they had a tendency to do, uh, especially after the U.S. fell in Vietnam. Great. Teddy, thank you so much. Stephen, Maddie, uh, appreciate your, your presentations. And Dr. Nielsen, to, uh, my thanks to you as well for helping get us started this morning. Thanks to those of you who've been attending and, and submitting questions. Uh, appreciate your presence here with us. Hopefully everyone can see on the screen uh, our uh, schedule uh, for what comes next. Uh, we'll be uh, enjoying the film projects from our uh, Freshman Honors Seminar, uh, Contemporary Questions. Uh, so that's a, that will be a whole new webinar. So we'll be closing this session and then moving uh, into, uh, into the next session. So you'll need to visit the Academic Symposium homepage. Uh, again, if you are trying to track that down, you can just Google ENC Academic Symposium and that should get you the links you need to get to the home page in the program where you can uh, find the information for joining our next session. Again, thanks very much, everybody. Have a wonderful day.